of the Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies and the Labor Solidarity Project at the University of Washington Tacoma. I'd like to welcome everyone back uh, to this installment of our fall seminar series, Labor Strikes Back. So as a, as a labor educator, one of my goals is to challenge students to think intersectionally. And I think, you know, labor issues, as we know, are kind of never just labor issues. They need to be understood alongside and contextualized within issues of race, ethnicity, gender, and nationality, to name just a few of those factors, right? And not only does gaining this perspective allow us to understand how economic motives compel people to act and structure their lives, uh, it also illuminates the opportunities and the limitations that those individuals face as they participate in the American workforce, right? Uh, but how... I think over time, I've realized that developing this perspective can be really difficult, uh, you know, particularly when it involves the labor that's performed by our most vulnerable and exploited workers, right? Uh, many of whom toil far beyond the, the, the sight lines of traditional journalism. Um, you know, sometimes it, it almost feels like there's a group of workers in this country that are almost invisible by design, right? And these are people whose labor goes unrecognized and often their voices go unheard. And I think uh, if, if you're here tonight, you probably agree with me that that is a real problem. And it's one that I think labor studies broadly seeks to solve. Um, you know, when it's, when it's done right, I think the field of labor studies uh, participates in what I call kind of a, a recuperative storytelling, right? It often, it often rescues those stories, those individuals and those movements from obscurity, and it, it, it celebrates their participation in a, what's an ongoing fight for economic, racial, and social justice. I think in the process, what it does is it renders, um, you know, those invisible citizens visible, and it creates a space where, you know, the historically silenced have an opportunity to speak. And our guest tonight has spent his entire career doing precisely this kind of recuperative work. Uh, David Bacon is a writer, a photographer, an oral historian, a former organizer, and so much work more. His, uh, his work documents labor, uh, the global economy, war, migration, environmentalism, and the struggle for human rights. Um, you know, he's the author of several books, including In the Fields of the North, The Right to Stay Home, Illegal People, uh, Communities Without Borders, and The Children of NAFTA. Uh, but he's joining us tonight to discuss his latest publication, which was published earlier this year, and it's titled More Than a Wall, Mosque Un Moro. Uh, and this book explores many aspects of the border region through photographs captured over a period of 30 years. But it also documents the changes in the border wall itself, but more importantly, the social movements in border communities, factories, and fields. So please join me in giving our guest tonight a round of digital applause. Thank you, David, for joining us this evening. I'm just so excited to share your work with our campus and community. Um, I know Casey, who's on the call, knows David actually joined us before the pandemic, so we got to meet once in person. Um, but I'm excited to, to learn more about your, your more recent work. Um, tonight, we're going to stick to our standard format with a presentation followed by some Q&A. Um, I've got a ton of questions from students that were submitted ahead of time. But then uh, during David's presentation, if you have questions, go ahead and type them in the chat room, and we'll try to kind of work our way uh, through the list after the presentation. So with all of that said, David Bacon, welcome back to UWT digitally. Well, thank you, Alex. I'm really glad to be here. Uh, UW Tacoma is one of my favorite campuses. I always like being there and being there digitally is almost as good as being there in person. So thank you so much for um, inviting me. So I'm gonna share the screen here. So I'm going, because I wanna share some photographs while I'm talking today. So here we go. Okay. So um, I want to start by reading you the two short memories of border crossers um, that start the book. One uh, I met in Omaha and the other in Tar Heel, North Carolina. And they connect this book with some of the ones that I've done before, especially illegal people and the right to stay home which situate these experiences within the overall system of displacement and migration in which millions of people participate. 
But since we're going to talk about the border and the wall, and most people think about the border as a place that people cross, um, let's start there. Okay, there we go. Um, so this is Lucia Pedrosa speaking, and she says, um, we were 12 and 10 years old. I had my Bible with me and I thought, I have faith. They took us to a part of the desert and at night we all began to walk. We were going to see my mom, so we packed our favorite clothes. After walking, we had to cross the river and took off our clothes to wade through the water. One of my shoes was swept away and a lady gave me hers. And then we had to run. And at the end, her feet were all cut up, but we were glad that we made it. Then this is Guadalupe Marroquin. And she says, one afternoon, the coyote took us down to a ravine. We climbed into a pipe, crawling on our hands and knees, one person behind the next. The pipe was only four feet around with sewage running at the bottom. It was very dark and the coyote warned us not to go off to the side or we'd get lost. I was very scared, but I needed to make it across. So I prayed to the saints. I arrived in Lumberton, North Carolina on a Saturday, went to mass and gave thanks to God on Sunday and went to work in the fields on Monday. These women, two of the millions who crossed the border between the United States and Mexico in the last two decades, described this perilous journey as they lived it. For them, the border is not just geography or a wall or a river, it is a passage of fire, an ordeal that must be survived in order to send money from work in the US back to a hungry family, to find children and relatives from whom they've been separated by earlier journeys, or to flee an environment that has become too dangerous to bear. Some do not survive, dying as they cross the desert or swim the Rio Bravo or murdered by gangs in Northern Mexico. To them, the border region has become a land of death. Every year, at least 400 people die trying to cross and are buried, often without names, in places like the graveyard here in the Holville Cemetery in the Imperial Valley. Agents of the US Border Patrol itself have been found guilty of beating and even shooting people, and the massive detention and deportation of 300 to 400,000 migrants every year is a form of economic and social violence as well. The precarious situation of women on the border became a political and social crisis when many were disappeared and murdered in Juarez. From 1996 to the fall of 2002, 284 women are known to have been murdered and 450 simply disappeared. At least 90 of their bodies have turned up in the desert, in the desert buried in shallow graves. But the border is also a land of the living. Over the past half century, the once small towns of Ciudad Juarez and Tijuana have become cities of millions. Again, agents of the um, border patrol themselves have been found guilty of, um, of beating and even shooting people. And the massive detention of 300 to 400,000 people is itself a form of economic and social violence. Um, but the border is also a land of the living. Over the past half century, this once small towns of Ciudad Juarez and Tijuana have become cities of millions. A huge part of the industrial workforce in the production and supply chain that delivers products to U.S. consumers lives not on the U.S. side of the border, but on the Mexican side. There, people built homes out of cardboard and shipping pallets cast off by the factories, that is, the maquiladoras. The dirt streets of the barrios often end at the border wall itself. Many neighbors, neighborhoods have no sewers and flood when it rains. Electricity is stolen by hooking up to power lines like these one, this shown in this photograph here, while drinking water comes in a truck and people must pay to fill the tank in front of their homes. And often living conditions for poor and homeless people in border cities like Tijuana are no different from those endured by migrants of, who have crossed the border to live in the US. The US-Mexico border is the subject of intense political controversy, mostly focusing on the idea that enforcement can keep people from crossing it. Lost is the reality that the border is a huge place where millions of people live and work. On the Mexican side, free trade policies hold down living standards and make union and community organizing risky and dangerous. And that in turn, 
produces pressure on people to seek better standard of living elsewhere by piercing the barrier. Images of men clustered next to the plates of the wall convey this idea even to the extent of documenting the hole through which they hope to travel. The photographs in this book therefore start where most visual documentation of the border does, and that is with the wall itself. They show as others have done, it's irrationality, heavily fortified in some places and curiously absent in others. The wall is not a new product project, and the photographs going back to the late 1980s show that even then it was deteriorating, more an ideological project than a true barrier. The images look at the structure as the people close to it do, an obstacle that keeps one group of men from crossing on Tijuana's pavement while they look at an airplane freely crossing in the air above as though the metal structure below hardly existed. Before 1848, there was no border in its current location whatsoever. That year, at the conclusion of what the US calls the Mexican War, the two countries signed the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Mexico was forced to give up 529,000 square miles of its territory. US troops occupied Mexico City to force the government there to sign the treaty. The so-called Mexican Cession accounts for 14.9% of the total land area of the United States. So the wall and the border, as they exist today, are the product of war. Ironically, as President Trump and previous U administrations have fortified it with ever larger structures, they've created ever greater memorials to this colonial war of conquest. For me as a photographer, putting images of the wall into context can help us to remember this history. They should provoke us to ask how the border and the wall came to be here to begin with. In fact, most people living near the border in Mexico don't have any hope or expectation of crossing it. More than half of the border population have no tourist visa or border crossing card. Instead, most border residents seek a way to earn a living and raise a family where they are. And when the wages are low and the housing often poor, they try to confront those conditions by changing them, not by crossing over to the other side. The border, therefore, has been the scene of some of Mexico's sharpest social struggles. And these photographs are an effort to document that social history. In the 1990s, in Macrovio Rojas, outside Tijuana, land occupiers fought the police inside of the border wall for the right to build homes, and in the same period, organized strikes for an independent union in the Han Young Maquiladora, which is what we see here. So the book moves away from the wall itself and the world of the border crossers to look at the communities like Maclovio Rojas. Because they were created by land occupations by poor people, often workers from the Maquiladoras, the community's legal titles were almost always denied by the governments that were anxious to protect investors. Facing efforts to drive them from their homes and off the land, they quickly became communities of resistance. When I began taking photographs there in the 1990s, Maclovio Rojas was the scene of intense conflict. Today, it is a much more peaceful place and its residents over the years have forced the local government to provide schools and at least a minimum level of services. The tradition of land occupation is still very much alive, however and similar communities of resistance exist on the outskirts of almost every large city on the border. Canyon Buena Vista was created in two separate land invasions by rural workers from the agricultural valley just south of Ensenada. The first was led by Benito Garcia, a charismatic leader of agricultural strikes in the early 1980s. Garcia organized farm workers who were living in labor camps or even sleeping by the roadside to occupy 50 acres on a desert hillside. And the book includes the memories of a young woman who was swept up in this movement, Natalia Bautista. The Confederation of Inde the Confederación Independiente de Obreras Agrícolas y Campesinos, or the Independent Confederation of Farm Workers and Farmers, a radical rural organization founded by the Mexican Communist Party, led many of these fights in the San Quintín Valley in the 1990s. Beatriz Chavez, who we see here, and Julio Sandoval were imprisoned in Ensenada for two years for occupying land for homes. These are communities created by land hunger, people drawn to the border for work, but with no provision made for housing. 
To survive, many communities of resistance appealed for support for the, from the Coalition for Justice in the Maquiladoras and other cross-border groups. The Frente Indígena de Organizaciones Binacionales organized support for indigenous migrants, both in their towns of origin in Oaxaca, in the towns south of the border in Baja California, and in indigenous communities north of the border in California. In other words, where indigenous people are going and communities are going in search of work. Popular rebellions on the border are not new. They've been going on for more than 100 years. In 1906, Colonel William Green, owner of the huge copper mine in Cananea, just a few miles south of Arizona and Sonora, brought the Arizona Rangers across the border to put down a strike now considered the first conflict of the Mexican Revolution. You know, you hear about the Texas Rangers, but there were Arizona Rangers and there were even California Rangers in this period, not long after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And the purpose of them all was the same. And that was to repress the communities of Mexican people, not only on the US side, but occasionally even on the Mexican side. From, 19, from 2007 on, men, miners in the Cananea mine struck against its current owner, Grupo Mexico, more than a century after that first battle, and then allied themselves with farmers who were protesting the pollution of the Sonora River by a massive toxic spill by Grupo Mexico in the Cananea mine, which was on strike at the time. For three decades, I've taken photographs of the many efforts by workers to organize to resist the poverty that the border factory regime imposes, showing both the actions in the streets and the costs visible in the homes of workers themselves, by miners and by people living throughout the border region. This book that contains 354 photographs along with a dozen oral histories that couple voices with the images that depict their lives and the purpose of this method is to present the border's residents as actors in pursuing social justice, not simply as victims of what they're protesting. The intention of these photographs, taken over three decades, is to provide a broader view, to help to come to terms with the sources of migration and to protect the human rights of migrants and working people. The border, as I said before, is a vast area with a vibrant social history. Over the past three decades, it has also become a powerful social symbol. The border played a big part in electing Donald Trump president whose campaign rallies featured chants of build the wall and promises to deport millions of people. The people who cross the border and now live in the North have become an integral part of the working class in the US. Nowhere is this more true than in agriculture. Both in Northern Mexico and along the Pacific coast of the US, most farm workers are indigenous migrants from Southern Mexican states like Oaxaca, Guerrero, and Michoacan. They speak languages that were thousands of year old, years old before the European colonization. And this ought to be familiar to you folks up there in Tacoma and Washington state because of the birth of the newest union that we have in this country for farm workers, that is Familias Unidas por la Justicia up in Bellingham, which was a creation of these same groups of farm workers migrating out of Oaxaca, Guerrero, and Michoacan in Southern Mexico. Farm labor is hard and dangerous work and often children join their parents in the fields. In recent years on both sides of the border, workers have gone on strike and organized new unions to raise wages and improve their conditions. These photographs demonstrate that in a world of globalized agriculture, the conditions of workers have become remarkably similar despite the vast difference in the standard of living from one side of the border to the other. As it presently exists, the wall is only a few decades old in its oldest sections. Already, even the newer wall of 20 foot high iron bars is rusting. This is not the Great Wall of China. It's clear that this wall is not a work for the ages, nor is it a great accomplishment of human labor or engineering. In fact, building it clearly didn't produce many jobs, skilled construction workers, that is electricians, pipe fitters, and build, bridge builders were not needed here. And you can see also the irrationality of it by the fact that it simply doesn't even exist in some places. The Immigration and Reform and Control Act in 1986, the amnesty law, began the process of dumping huge resources into the border, into border enforcement. A real fence was built early in the 1990s made of metal sheets 
taken from decommissioned aircraft carrier landing platforms. The sheets had holes so someone could peek through, but for the first time, people coming from each side could no longer physically mix or together or hug each other. That old wall still exists in many places on the Mexican side, but Operation Gatekeeper sought to push border crossers into remote desert regions where crossing was much more difficult and dangerous. And to do that, the government had contractors build a series of walls that were harder to cross. The aircraft landing strips were replaced in 2007 by the 20 foot wall of vertical metal columns and those metal columns were extended into the Pacific. The wall at the Parque de la Amistad in Tijuana has become an ever changing artwork. As the bars rust, they've been painted with graffiti that protest this brutal division. Meanwhile, the border crossings themselves increasingly become sites of protest over the policies that kill migrants or against political repression in Mexico that forces people to consider leaving or here in the case of strikers in San Quentin who marched up to the border wall as a way of saying to people in the United States, when you eat those strawberries or tomatoes, think of us, the people who are picking them. The wall's main importance again in the US is its symbolism that is used to win higher budgets for the US Department of Homeland Security and votes for Trump. And given that about four and a half million Mexican migrants lived in the US in 1990, and 12.7 million by 2008, the wall did not stop migration across the border despite its catastrophic human cost. But the wall itself has also been used for art, protesting the death of migrants or highlighting the migrant experience. In the first years of the mass deaths of Operation Gatekeeper, Tijuana artists made sculptures of the plastic water bottles left in the desert to rescue migrants. They placed them on the wall itself with crosses, as we see here, with the names of people who were found dead in the wilderness. Other artists, myself included, have used the wall for public exhibitions, mounting large photographic prints on the bars, showing the lives of migrants on the US side. This has been done only on the Mexican side, since the US Border Patrol prevents such displays and often even simple access to the US side of the barrier. When people arrive at the US border, they're treated like criminals. John Kelly, a Marine Corps general who advised Donald Trump in the White House, called migration, quote, a criminal terror convergence, unquote, a pretext for criminalizing migrants and justifying mass deportations. But even under President Obama, the number of deportations swelled to over 400,000 per year and a systematic system of a system of detention centers, mostly run by private corporations, extended across the US. It's no wonder that the number of de deported people living in Mexican border cities can be counted in the thousands. Some become workers in the maquiladoras or wash car windows in the street. In the US media, however, people become invisible once they've been put across the border. And for over two decades, I've taken photographs to document what happens to them. People in the movement have faith and trust in my intentions in a way they might not for an unknown photographer, which is one of the things that allows me to take pictures like this. I carry my camera as a tool to help stop this abuse, but also to take photographs that will help people organize. I've taken the camera into the Tijuana River Channel, as you see here. Deportees become invisible after they're deported at a time when it's the hardest for them to survive. So the images include people collecting cans and bottles for recycling, as we saw before, or here simply cooking on the concrete bank of the channel. But deportees and supporters have also organized to make survival easier and ultimately to protest the system itself. Border Angels group um, here in the US helped migrants take over the migrant hotel in Mexicali to give shelter and food to people as they're deported through the border gate. Even the park next to the Tijuana River became a protest site as homeless migrants and deportees joined city activists to stop its privatization at the same time as they lived on the site in an Occupy style protest. It's a balance to produce committed documentation as a participant and as a partisan, and at the same time, avoid romanticizing social movements. I don't think a photograph can humanize or put a human face on people or events 
But I understand the intention to make a political protest or problem more accessible to a broader audience by focusing on an individual in front of a lens. It is a big media story, and it produces a fascination with the border among US and international photographers and artists who then create photo documentaries and art projects popular in the mainstream media. Often, we're only looking at the border from the US side. And that's certainly the case with this art, um, art exhibit that was created by JR, in which you know, the intention was to see the fence with the image of a child sort of peering over it with their hands on the top of the fence. And this is something that you could only see from the US side. But if you're on the Mexican side, as you are here, you can see that really the art project really almost made no sense at all. According to one eminent photographer, he said, our obsession with the border has a lot of fantasy involved. You're searching for something, but it's not really there. This we're talking about a, a photographer who had her photographs published in the New Yorker magazine. Her photographs were all taken in the US. Mexicans exist only once they've arrived in the North. Don Barletti, who wrote an introduction to this book, says, when did this contemporary diaspora become a fantasy? In his years at the Los Angeles Times, he probably took more photographs of the border than any other US photographer. And he said, the border is certainly clearly defined for the millions of people who are searching for something better on the other side. Enrique Botello, a photographer in Ensenada and the founder, founder of Galleria uh, 184, says, most US photographers don't understand the price that we're paying on the border in terms of the number of people dying. They're motivated mainly by self-interest because the subject of the border is easy to sell. Yet Mexican artists create their own art about the migration experience because it is such a fundamental part of Mexican life. Virtually every family has a member or friend who has crossed to the US where over 9% of the country's population now lives. And this is one thing that Border Angels does on the border um, as often as they can on Sundays. And that is they arrange for a part of the family on the Mexican side to come and meet with the part of the family that is living over on the US side where they can see and poke their fingers through these little mesh holes in the wall to touch each other. At the ironically named Friendship Park, the Parque de la Amistad in Playa de Tijuana, the graffiti on the wall's bars is also an art project. The wall there and on the fence leading to Mexicali's crossing gate has become a venue for photographers and artists. Their art is sharp, critiquing mass deportations and the hard lives of migrants on the other side. Art or photography can help change the world. It arises from the political commitment of the artists and the photographer. We should strengthen solidarity on all the borders of the world, Enrique Botello urges, so that someday all of those borders will disappear. Part of the purpose of my photography in the border region, therefore, is to make images that are intended to have this sharp critical edge to provoke questions about the reality that people experience who actually live there. Juan Manuel Barragan Corona, who we see here, who was recently expelled from the US living in the river bottom in Tijuana, has a wife and two teenage children in Las Vegas. He says, we are the invisible people. In this life, no one counts for less than a deported Mexican. But lives on, lives on the US side hardly count for more. On the US side, the book looks at the tiny towns in the borderland of East San Diego County, Campo and Tierra del Sol. For the people who live there, some with roots going back for generations, these tiny communities are home to growing hunger and poverty. Up the road from Campo is the town of Boulevard, and near it used to sit Camp Vigilance, home to the Minutemen Civil Defense Corps, a right-wing anti-immigrant militia. Until fed up locals stopped it, the Blackwater Security Company planned to open a clandestine facility as well, training paramilitaries for action against the poor farmers and workers who are making the trek north from Mexico. The national media described this section of the border as immigration ground zero. Official border enforcement and violence by right-wing militias is their big story. But for the people who live here, 
The real story is not having enough to eat. East San Diego County, the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, and the Imperial Valley here in California, all are border communities and all share the distinction of being the poorest counties in the US. On top of poverty and hunger, border communities face extreme air pollution and the illnesses that come from it. When the dust rises in North Shore, a small farm worker town at the edge of the Salton Sea, Jacqueline Pozar's nose often starts bleeding and her teacher at Saul Martinez Elementary School in nearby Mecca calls her mom Maria and asks her to come and take her home. These photographs tell a story of communities that are very similar to those on the other side of the border. The impact of environmental crisis, whether the drying of the Salton Sea or the pollution of the Sonora River, doesn't end at some political line in the sand. Communities in the Imperial Valley, like Westmoreland and Heber, or in eastern San Diego County, like Tierra del Sol, feel the impact of poverty as much as Maclovio Rojas or Canyon Buena Vista on the other side. Traveling through these communities for over 30 years and taking these photographs and interviewing the people living there, I've been struck many times by how similar they are. And this similarity isn't limited to just environmental or social conditions. In these photographs, community members looking for a way to survive and end the dust contamination and the horrible smells from the Salton Sea look very much like those farmers on the Sonora River trying to survive the toxic spill from the Cananea mine. These photographs document the work and the lives of those who cross the border. Some focus on those jobs and farm labor that require skill, courage, and determination. Women lift and throw 40 pound boxes of lettuce, a job that used to be restricted to men. Palmeros climb ladders into palm trees, balancing on the fronds and risking their lives far above the ground. Workers in these jobs labor in fields that are sometimes inside of the border wall itself or just a few miles away. And as migrants move away from the border, they keep alive and reinvent their culture and traditions, often those of indigenous communities. Their message communicated in these photographs is that the border region actually forms a single, very complex social fabric. Through it runs the borderline with its walls, but in the end, a wall cannot forever divide and separate the people and communities living here. When we go to the border and listen to the people in the migrant camps or talk with the families here who have members in the immigration detention center, we hear the living experience of the people who have had no alternative to living, leaving home. Escaping violence, war, and poverty, they now find themselves imprisoned and we have to ask, who is responsible? Where did the violence and poverty come from? that force people to leave home, to cross our border with Mexico, and then be picked up and incarcerated here. At the end of the just concluded summit of some of the Americas, announcing a Los Angeles declaration on migration and protection, President Biden claimed, we're transforming our approach to managing migration in the Americas, recognizing the responsibility that impacts all of our nations. Recognizing that the U.S. has some responsibility for addressing the causes of migration is important, but the president stopped well short of acknowledging the two-century history of U.S. intervention in Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean, which lies at the root. We need to deal with the root causes. Since 1994, 8 million Mexicans have come as migrants to work in the U.S., Again, in 1990, four and a half million Mexican migrants lived here. And in 2008, the number peaked at 12.67 million people. About 5.7 million were able to get some kind of visas, which means that another 7 million couldn't, but came anyway. Almost 9% of the people of Mexico live here in the US. US auto companies employ more workers in Mexico now than in the US. Every flat panel TV sold here is made in Mexico or another country. While the workers at General Motors Silao factory recently voted courageously for an independent union and negotiated a new contract with important wage gains, a worker in that factory still earns less in a whole day than a US auto worker earns in an hour. Decades of trade agreements and economic reforms have created that difference and forced people into poverty. And for many that makes migration involuntary 
He only means to survive. But if you think changing this is impossible or just a dream, remember that a decade after Emmett Till was lynched in Mississippi, the US Congress passed the Civil Rights Act. And that same year, Congress put the family preference immigration system into law, the only pro-immigrant legislation we've had for 100 years, 1965. And that was no gift. A civil rights movement made Congress pass that law. And when that law was passed, we had no detention centers like the ones that imprison migrants today. There were no walls on our border with Mexico and no one died crossing it. There is nothing permanent or unchangeable about these institutions of oppression. We have changed our world before and a people's movement can do it again. So that's it. Thank you for sharing these photographs with me. Excellent. And what an uplifting note to end on. Uh, so join me in a, a round of applause for our guest tonight, David Bacon. Thank you so much for your work. Uh, absolutely fascinating. I can't wait to get my hands on a physical copy of this book. Um, but the, the, the work is amazing. I, I, I love your characterization of, of the border as a kind of passage of fire or an ordeal. Um, this idea that it that it works sort of more uh, more as an ideological project than an actual structural one. These are just really important ideas to consider in terms of the the wall and sort of the rhetoric of the American imagination. Um, so for our attendees, if you have questions, go ahead and type them into the chat room. We've got uh, some questions that were submitted ahead of time that I can work my way through as you all type. Um, I was curious to know uh, before we got started though, what what initially drew you to the the border? This is a site you've been returning to throughout your career. Um, what how, how did you get started there? Well, I think I'll tell you a little story. Um, I went to work for the Farm Workers Union um, in the 1970s, um, having grown up in Oakland, knowing no Spanish, knowing really nothing about rural life about Chicanos, Mexicanos. Um, but because of the boycott and the great strike, you know, I was sort of caught up in the support movement for the Farm Workers Union. And I eventually went to work um, as first as a legal worker. And then when my Spanish got good enough um, as an organizer for the union. And so I went once to organize workers in a um, uh, tangerine crew in the Coachella Valley and met this old guy. And in the process of you know our discussions, he started telling me a little bit about his life story and about the story of how his uh, father had been involved in the land reform struggles in Baja California, not too long below, uh, far below the border, and how they had organized themselves to seize the land and the the landowner had resisted and they burned down the landowner's um, house and they murdered the Hacendado, and then his father had to flee, and that's why they wound up on the U.S. side of the border. It was, of course, a very dramatic story, but um, it also got me really interested in this idea of, of, the, of the border and, and what was happening on the other side of it, and this idea that, that people were coming here with these experiences of tremendous social struggles, that they were not just simply blank slates of people, but they were people with traditions that were in some ways much more dramatic than the one I was familiar with. And as I went on to work as an organizer for the next 20 some odd years, um, most of the organizing had to do with helping immigrant workers, um, especially from Mexico, but Central America and the Philippines, organized unions. And um, the more I did this, the more I got interested in why people were coming, what was happening, and got interested in going to Mexico, and then the border itself. So because in the Farm Workers Union, you're working right next to the border, you can see it all the time, people are crossing it all the time. The first immigration raid I ever saw was in the Coachella Valley, um, which is not far from the border. And I think it was those experiences as an organizer that got me interested. And so when I began working as a photographer and as a, a writer, it was kind of natural to start taking pictures of what I already knew was there, which was, you know, in this case, I think the first big photographic project I did was to go to um, the Coachella Valley and take pictures of the palmeros and the palm trees. And then from there um, down to uh, the border itself. And so that's kind of how it all 
grew or what it all grew out of. And then the next 30 years of basically going there quite often and, and covering what was happening. It's interesting because these, you know, migrants cross the border and are some ways sort of overdetermined in terms of the narrative that's often ascribed to them, you know, whether it's Sheriff Joe Arpaio or Trump, you know, these are individuals who are sort of marked before they even enter, you know, the, the, the nation with sort of a narrative. And it seems like your your photographs really work to, you know, reverse that narrative. Um, and we've got a question in the chat chat board here about um, students who are interested in getting involved in photojournalism, specifically the type of photojournalism that, that leans toward activism. Do you have any advice for those students? Well, I think that, um, well, let me just talk about how, what, what happened to me. Um, because I was a union organizer first and having had been also a factory worker, um, I knew something about working class life. And so when I became a photographer and a journalist, like I say, it was natural to, you know, in fact, the motivation for it really was to document in photographs and in narratives and in writing um, this social phenomenon that I was seeing as, a, um, as an organizer and as a worker. Um, you know, the changing demographics of the workforce in California, and I'm sure in Washington, the same thing has happened. In fact, I know it has. Um, you know, the, the stories that people bring with them, but especially the social movements. You know, I got really interested in the, in, again, what, what, we're, what people bring with them. You know, when I was in Seattle um, during Occupy, I went out to the Occupy over by the college there, and I saw this banner at the entrance to the Occupy, and it said, El Plantón de Seattle. And I thought that was a very good thing because it was giving credit to people for having brought the idea of Occupy to Seattle. When you call it a Plantón, what you mean is that it is a occupation that people do in Mexico and in the Philippines, like at the gates of factories where they go on strike or as a protest in the main square in Mexico city. And so the Plantón of Seattle is like taking it to Seattle. I'm not saying that we don't have our own traditions of occupation here in the US, but I think it was sort of giving credit where credit is due. And this is sort of what, one of the big motivations for me is to document this whole thing of, of social struggle and the culture of social struggle and what it looks like and what people think about it and how it um, how it happens. Um, so I was able to do this partly because I had a certain history that I came with myself, but also because I do it through organizations that people have through social movements. You know, I'm a participant photographer, a participant journalist. I didn't go to journalism school. In fact, journalism schools kind of hate me because the first thing I'll say is it is important for you to participate in the world and the photography and the, the writing, they come out of that participation. You shouldn't try to be a um, quote objective in the sense of the journalism school will tell you, you shouldn't try to be neutral because how can you be, it's like a strike. How can you be neutral? You're on one side or the other. Um, so know who you are and participate and um, have the work that you do come out of that participation. So what that means is that if you're in um, Washington state, you know, one way of covering um, what's happening or one way of approaching your photojournalism is to go up to Bellingham and to Mount Vernon and cover what's going on with Familias Unidas and community to community, that's what I did. Um, you could go to, I've forgotten where it is, um, in, um, in the Yakima Valley that they have that mushroom strike that's going on, you know, farm workers at Ostrom, you know, go and cover it. But cover it from the point of view of supporting the workers, trying to figure out what you can do as a journalist and as a photographer that's going to help move that movement forward. Um, in order to kind of like, um, because I know that you're asking this as a student. Um, I think that it's important to, to get skills 
um, and journalism schools and universities have skills to offer. Um, so to city colleges, you know, I did my, um, I went through the photography program at the community college that we have here. It had a very good one um, because it was very practical. I learned a lot from it. Um, and I think that, um, you know, take the skills that you can, um, that are on offer where you can find them. But in terms of how you go about doing the work and who you are doing the work, um, my advice is participate in the world. Um, do your work through the organizations of people that are out there involved in this kind of social struggle and this kind of work. And then, you know, use what you produce to help move that further along. You know, I would never have been I would never have been able to go to Canyon Buena Vista or to um, Maclovio Rojas had I not been active in the support movement for Maquiladora workers. That's who brought me there. And that's who introduced me to the people there. But it's kind of a deal, too. You know, you get introduced to these things in order to do what? And the answer is in order to help those movements and your photographs can help, your writing can help, all these things can help, but they help because you try and figure that out. You know, you don't look at it as being somebody else's problem or that you're just gonna throw this into the world and have done with it. Um, you're not a parachute journalist, you're not a parachute photographer, don't try and be one. Um, I, I know that you have to go to work for a living. Photographers do. So sometimes you're going to go to work for a newspaper. A newspaper is going to send you here and they're going to send you there. But Don Barletti, for instance, worked for the LA Times for 30 years as their person on the border and wound up with this incredible body of photographic work, which unfortunately belongs to the LA Times, and um, knowing a great deal about it. So he was able to combine, you know, that sort of job, job, you know, the wage job of being a photographer for the LA Times, but also doing work that I think really advanced our understanding of the communities of the border and what was happening on the border there. So um, I know that's sort of a complicated answer to the question, but that's what I got. No, it's great advice. I think it's important to get involved and I loved your um, your observation about the, the Occupy uh, site up in Seattle as, as sort of situating itself in a, in a much larger ongoing fight, right? I mean, this is part of the um, part of the work. I mean, when, when I look at your photographs, you know, I see, you know, the the individual sort of instances of a, a global phenomenon that involve national economic trends. Um, I'm kind of curious. We had a, a question submitted ahead of time. We read um, one of your recent articles uh, that you published in the Sierra Club. The uh, what will it take to build a broad based movement for a just transition? Um, and, and one of my students was was very appreciative of your work and I think was looking for sort of language we could use uh, to, to sort of communicate to people who might not sort of be aware of the, the conditions that farm workers fake face on a daily basis. Um, and the question was just like, what does the average person not know about their groceries and where they come from? And how could we, you know, uh, work on developing an approach to sort of educating our, our peers about sort of why they should care? Um, you know, and another question that came in about sort of well, why, you know, we live 2000 miles away from the border. Why is this something that somebody in Washington should be sort of um, not only aware of, but sort of care deeply about? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm kind of combining a couple questions here, but I think the first one had to do with, um, you know, how do you, well, I guess the, the first one we can work in sort of chronological order. Um, why should all of our students here at UWT uh, feel passionately about these issues? Um, and then once they've once they've acquired that passion, how do they sort of, if they're not going into photojournalism, how do they sort of communicate to others uh, why this is something that they should also feel passionate about? Okay, well, let me take them in another order. Um, starting with, uh, you know, what should people know if they don't know about farm workers and the, fruits and vegetables that we eat. Um, so I think that, you know, teachers have this, this kind of slogan that's 
you know, students learn uh, students learning conditions are teachers working conditions. In other words, the welfare of students and teachers are bound up together. Um, and I think that you can say that say it in a different way in relation to farm workers, and that is that the um, the conditions of farm workers have an impact on the kind of food we eat from all different ways of looking at it. Um, first of all, the obvious one was around pesticides, you know, where the farm workers unions have been making a lot of um, protests about pesticide use because what harms farm workers in the field winds up obviously on the fruits and vegetables that you eat. After all, we're trying to eat organic wide because we want to get away from the chemical inputs in agriculture. And that tells you something about what that must have been like for um, the workers who were intimately you know, exposed to it. Um, but it's true in, in other ways too, that um, even if you have workers working in an organic field, um, does that necessarily mean that things are better for them? And the answer is, well, sometimes yes and sometimes no that um, it's good because they're not exposed to the pesticides any longer. Um, on the other hand, the wages are the same. And you know, I wrote another article that was about um, sexual harassment in the fields. And actually, you know, sexual harassment is very omnipresent in, um, for farm worker women. And it is just as much a question in um, in fields as it is in organic fields as it is in non-organic fields. So you know you could say, why do we have Me Too, right? The Me Too is about when recognizing that that this was happening to them all over the place. Me too, right? And farm worker women too. So you know we should have the same concern about sexual harassment and rape among farm worker women. We would have about the sexual harassment and rape of any woman. Um, so, because we all live in the same world, right? Um, injustice has no borders to it, and it spreads. You have, if you have a culture in which um, this is acceptable, then it's not just going to be confined to, you know, farm workers or aspiring starlets on the studio couch. It's going to be, it's going to be everywhere. So, I think that's another way of, of explaining it, and that is that we all live in the world. We live in the same world. Another reason why people ought to be concerned about it is because um, if you make the working conditions and the wages so bad, the it's, it's going to be hard for us to get the food that we eat because, after all, farm workers are the ones who produce it, and the people are going to produce more and better food um, if they are have a, a decent living and decent working conditions. And the last argument I think is basic working class solidarity. You know, the working conditions of workers are should be of concern to all of us, you know, because um, we are all part of the working class of this country. You know, farm workers just along with longshoremen and, and uh, janitors and everybody else. So class solidarity, I think counts for a lot. It's easy to write farm workers out of that because they're not visible really, because they're in rural areas and most of us live in cities. And so we don't see it, um, but it's important to remember that, that people are there. I think that also talks a little bit about, you know, why we should care about it. You know, I tend to make, I, I, the argument that's most important to me really, and this, I, comes out of being a radical and a union organizer and all the rest of it is um, is class solidarity, really. You know, we need to change this country. We need to change the society that we live in. We need socialism. We need a better, um, a better way of organizing our world here. And in, in this country in particular, and the only way we're gonna get it is by working people uh, taking action in all the different various ways in which we can and, and have been doing that and will do it in the future. And that all requires unity. It requires us to do this together. And farm workers are part of that. You know, they have some special characteristics in terms of who they are and how they work. 
um, but they are they, they are part of the working class of this country and have as much of an interest in changing it and in social justice as the rest of us do. And so that's a very, to me, a very powerful argument that we cannot make progress without it. We cannot change our world the way we need to change it um, without it. But I think there are also, you know, the moral arguments that also I think carry weight. You know, people produce the food that we eat. Don't we have an obligation here? I think clearly we do. You know, we have an obligation to be concerned about it. It's not, it, it's not, how you want to put it? I was going to say it's not special to farm workers. It is kind of special to farm workers because our relationship to food is so important. But, you know, if we watch TV on a flat screen TV, we ought to be as concerned about the working conditions of the person who made that TV um, as we, you know, and recognize that it was human labor that went into it and therefore we should be concerned about it. Um, and I think that argument holds true for all um, workers, but it holds true for farm workers um, in particular. So, I guess so just, just some thoughts about it. Well, and you're right to say that, you know, so much of that labor is invisible to so many of us. Um, but the, you know, the results of that labor is often winds up on our plate, right? We're sort of surrounded by the, you know, the, um, the effect of the labor, the consequence of the labor, but we don't sort of, you know, take the, take the time to sort of track that, that sort of chain of possession back to its origins. Yeah. I think. Well, we consume the commodity. Yeah. And, and, and because it's food, we consume it in a very intimate way. It goes right into us. And we spend a huge amount of our time cooking and talking about it and involvement with food all over the place. So, you know, it is special in that way, I think. Yeah. Have you seen um, another article that I, I had the students read in advance um, was the uh, recent piece that ran in the nation, the Biden versus Newsom on far farm workers' rights to vote? Um, about the uh, AB 2183, that legislation. Um, can you can you just sort of walk us through kind of how you see that kind of legislation? I think I had a couple of students who were, um, you know, generally we think of California up here in Washington as, as sort of one of the good states, right? Sort of working on behalf of farm workers. So I had a couple of students who were, um, who were concerned, well, if, if it was this difficult to get legislation passed in California, you know, what does this look like in some of those redder states where a lot of this agricultural work is taking place? And then, um, you know, just how sort of legislation like that, uh, you know, it simultaneously represents a, a step forward or, you know, potential progress, but then also, um, you know, when so many of these efforts sort of die on the, to use a terrible <laughs> metaphor in this case, um, you know, what does that mean about sort of the the progress that's being made around this type of work? Well, just specifically about the law to begin with, uh, what it basically is, is what's called a card check law. In other words, that um, workers who want to organize a union can do so by signing what are called authorization cards saying that you want to be part of the union, you want the union to represent you. And that if a majority of the people working in a certain workplace sign those cards and then turn them into a state agency, that the employer then has to recognize the union and bargain a contract. Um, you, all unions have want this. And we have tried to reform our national labor legislation in this country to get this, and we have not been successful at getting it um, through Congress, um, but it's on the agenda of, of unions everywhere. And I think it's very interesting and very significant that the first, well, no, they're not the first because actually public employees, some groups of public employees in some places have it, and California being one of those places where public employees have this right first. But organizing in the public sector is a little different from organizing in the private sector where you have a private boss will basically do anything to stop the union. And that's the reason for the law is that even though California had a law passed in 1975, the Agricultural Labor Relations Act, which set up a process in which workers could vote for a union. And if they um, voted, majority voted in favor of the union, then the employer in theory was obligated to um, negotiate a contract. And it also, the law also said 
that um, it was illegal for an employer to try and intimidate workers to stop them from organizing. Um, like was true with our national legislation, the law didn't work very well because um, growers and employers did exactly what the law prohibited them from doing, which was threatening people, firing people, terrorizing their workers, doing everything they possibly could to convince workers that the union was a terrible thing so that by the time the voting actually took place, the workers were scared out of their minds and would just vote no, you know, vote the way the grower wanted them to vote for fear of losing their jobs. And um, so the problem was, and then even when, when, when workers did vote in favor of the union, the employers would just simply refuse to negotiate a contract and there was really no penalty for that. So the Farm Workers Union in California eventually proposed two laws to change that, to try to change that. So one law said, it was just called mandatory, um, mandatory mediation, said that when workers vote in favor of a union and the employer refuses to bargain or doesn't bargain in good faith, the union can then turn to a state agency and the state agency will take the union's last proposal in negotiations and force it on the employer and make the employer sign it as a union contract. Um, that's something that hardly exists anywhere um, for any union. And then because it didn't, um, because it still had workers voting in this situation in which, you know, you had elections, but the employer would terrorize the workers to get the, the choosing out of this environment in which it was so easy for employers to intimidate workers, you had you set up another process in which workers could simply sign the cards at home or wherever, and you get a majority of the workers to sign the card and you turn them into the state, and that's the same thing as having an election. And that sort of avoids the psychological war uh, against the workers and against the union. So that was what the law was designed to do. And, um, you know, California is true. California is the only state that has it in this way. New York State just passed a kind of a collective bargaining law for farm workers. Um, it's not quite as elaborate as the California law, and it doesn't have these other two laws attached to it yet. But I think that, the, you know, New York is moving in that direction. Um, Washington State, um, you know, I've had, I've had labor lawyers in Washington State explain to me that there are some, some rights to collective action that farm workers have in Washington State that are not the same as the California law, but it's not as though farm workers in Washington State have no rights. Um, but the union contracts that have been won for farm workers at Chateau Saint-Michel and at Sukuma Farms and, and Driscoll's um, were one because of a combination of worker action at work, in other words, strikes and work stoppages and very good organizing on the part of the workers themselves, and then boycotts, you know, the threat to cut off sales. And that scared Chateau Saint-Michel and it scared Driscoll's enough so that they forced, uh, um, well, in the case of Driscoll's, they forced Sukuma to um, agreed to the contract. So even in the absence of the law, it's possible for workers to organize. And we actually have farm worker unions in different parts of the United States, even though we don't have those laws. Um, I'm not saying that the law isn't important. It is, and it can create a, a, a legal avenue for doing this, which is important. But it's not as though people cannot organize and cannot strike and cannot um, win unions and contracts without it. And I think that the trend is going in that direction. If you go back 50 years, you know, we had one small organization of farm workers that was sponsored by the AFL-CIO. And then we had the beginning of the National Farm Workers Association. And then we had the grape strike. And following the grape strike, then we had this beginning of this proliferation of farm worker unions. So, um, I think it's important to struggle for law, but it's also possible for workers to organize even if they don't have one. And actually organizing without the law 
is a good motivation for getting growers and legislators to think about having law because they don't want strikes. So anyway, that's just how the law works and where it came from. Well, I think that that public buy-in is is so important, right? That's you, you got to hit them in the wallet at the end of the day, right? And that's I think uh, one of my students pointed out the uh, the fact that you know Gavin Newsom has um, you know connections within the you know the, the universe of big agriculture. Um, couldn't help but notice the irony of the fact that he took uh, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars from the the owners of a, uh, an organization just called the Wonderful Company, which seems like something out of a satirical post-apocalyptic like uh workplace farce um you know how do we uh, how do we hold our public elected officials accountable when they're you know even even in the era of blind trusts like they clearly don't work and these people are often overly leveraged um how uh, just to just to answer that one student's question about sort of you know non-california and washington states if we're looking at sort of uh redder states you know, should we just assume that they're, you know, in a, a generation behind us in terms of legislation or that it's gotten even worse over the last 10, 15 years? Well, you know, I wouldn't call Washington a redder state to begin with. I mean, I think sometimes I think Washington is out in front of California. Oh, uh, no, no. I was I was placing Washington and California sort of in the in the good states. You know, oh, what about in the, good, in the good category? Yeah. Well, um, you know, first of all, looking at other states, I want to say something about Washington in a second, but looking at other states, you know, so, so-called redder states, um, you know, the Farm Labor Organizing Committee had started out in Ohio, not particularly, well, I guess in ancient history, pro-labor state, but certainly a redder state now. And, um, then went off to North Carolina and was able to sign a big contract, which is a somewhat controversial contract, but in North Carolina, again, using boycotts as essentially the, the tool for it. Um, there is a farm worker union in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. They at one point organized a big mushroom growing operation in Pennsylvania. And um, then they existed for a while and eventually they lost the union there. So it kind of goes, it goes up and down. But I think that, that a lot depends on what workers on the ground do and what they want and how angry they are and where people start to organize and they have the motivation to do it. I think that they find ways to do it, red state or, or not. And it's not just true for farmers. I think this is true for workers generally. I think one of the main things that we have to think about in this country is um, organizing the South and the Southwest, you know, which were traditionally the non-union parts of this country, the red parts of this country, if you will. And, um, and there are a lot of important lessons to be learned from those organizing efforts that have gone on there. And there have been very significant ones and a number of them over the years. You know, what they sometimes lack is the institutional support and the money that could come from the institutions of the labor movement and unions in, in other places. So, you know, unions are often very narrow, focused, and self-interested institutions. And it's hard for unions to think in the, that kind of strategic way. Um, but we are hopefully making a change in the labor movement to doing that, because if we don't, we are um, we are in for some very, very rough years. Um, and it also includes, you know, the, the fact that, that Chris Smalls and the Amazon Labor Union organized that Amazon warehouse in Staten Island tells you something about the ability of workers to confront even huge corporations under and under the right circumstances with the right group of workers um, to win very significant victories for it. So I don't think the the politics or the political atmosphere of red states, we should look at as being kind of like making them off limits to worker organizing and off limits to unions. Um, I think that the, if they make it more difficult without question, but um, I think there are very significant experiences that, that workers and unions have in organizing in those areas and really pay attention to them and then reinforce them. Washington, I think has, has been a very interesting state because the legislative efforts that have been made 
especially by community to community of Familias Unidas por la Justicia, have centered not around trying to get Washington State to pass a collective bargaining law, but around the problem of the H-2A workers. And I think this is probably because the problem of the H-2A workers in Washington State is so extreme. You know, the percentage of the farm workers in Washington that is now made up of workers recruited in Mexico under the H-2A visa program is now at least a third, and I think it's probably almost half of the farm worker workforce in Washington State. So first of all, what that means is, you know, I don't wanna get into this long detailed explanation about the problems of the H-2A program um, called close to slavery by people who say how it treats the workers who are in it, but also what it means for the workers, farm workers who live in Washington State, it means displacement. It means losing your jobs. It means losing the work. So it has created this crisis in Washington State and what Familias Unidas did, and community community did, Rosalinda Guillen, I think, I think is a brilliant strategist, was get Washington State to pass a law that um, because the federal government was not overseeing this, um, although theoretically they were supposed to, they didn't, they're not doing it, um, that Washington State would set up a commission that would look at the H-2A program. And both in terms of the welfare of the workers who were part of it, and the fact that you know, workers like Ernesto Silva died in a field in Northern Washington because of the abuses and workers who protested were deported and so forth. And also look at the problem of the displacement, what this was meaning for the farm workers in Washington set up a commission that was responsible for looking at this. That's something that doesn't exist anywhere else. And when the pandemic started, the commission and the farm worker advocates on the commission proposed that H-2A workers no longer be housed in barracks in which they were sleeping in bunk beds because it was impossible for people to isolate themselves sufficiently. And we started having you know, concentrations of infection in the barracks for H-2A workers. We had a couple of workers die at the Gebers Farm in Eastern Washington. And um, there was a big political fight in Washington state over the bed bug, uh, the, <laughs> the bunk bed requirement. And in the end, the growers won. They got um, labor and industries and the state government in Washington to agree that under certain circumstances, it would be okay for growers to continue to house workers in these barracks in which they were sleeping in bunk beds. And the reason for that was just simply money that you know you have stemo with 1500 workers sleeping in these barracks you cut the you know ability to house those workers in half stemo's going to have to build housing for 750 workers by its next harvest they clearly did not want to have to spend that money and then i did circle neither did the washington farm labor association and they were able to prevail in the washington state government to get rid of the bunk bed requirement um still I think that it is a fight that's never happened anywhere else. California, we should have had that fight. You know, we had workers die because we didn't have that fight. And um, so I think that that different states and different groups of workers and the uh, people who are fighting with them have come up with different ideas about what the fight should be about and how to go about doing it. But I think Washington State has had some things that you can feel very proud of having done in the uh, um, interest of you know, justice for farm workers, for sure. Excellent. We've got a, another question on the chat board here about um, uh, battling the trope of white saviorism and performativity as someone doing this work um, you know, with, with uh, ethnic communities and as workers also being exploited, how do you suggest we battle with the dilemma of whether to choose lower priced items or worker solidarity? Sort of a twofer. Could you repeat the question? I'm, I'm not quite getting it here. The first one, um, I guess the first part is how do you how do you battle the trope of white saviorism and performativity as someone doing this work? Um, and then the second one is more about sort of the dilemma of whether to you know, choose a lower priced item or worker solidarity. I see. Okay. Two, yeah, these are very different questions. Yeah. Okay. White saviorism. I take it what you mean is that, um, is it legitimate for white people to 
work in solidarity and support of farm workers for organizations like Community Community or Familias Unidas or in boycott committees um, on college campuses supporting those boycotts if they're white. Um, you know, when, when students at UT Tacoma, at uh, UW Tacoma and at UW Seattle um, organized support committees for Familias Unidas, um, they did that because the workers came down from Bellingham and Mount Vernon and they visited those campuses and spoke with students and asked them, help us. You know, we are in a fight with this company. And if you support us and you start picketing stores like Costco and getting the berries off the shelves, um, you will make it possible for us to be able to strike in, in Bellingham and win a contract. And, um, and that in fact is what happened. Um, so was it legitimate for the white students on those campuses to support the workers? Clearly it was. Um, you know, I'm not sure if this is what you're referring to as white saviorism, um, because I think that I need a, a, another example of it. If you, if you, if what you're talking about is something different, you know, because I think what I see is important here is the need for class solidarity here. You know, in other words, that that people need to support those workers who are out on strike and who are struggling. Um, because it's important to working people generally. And um, white people are part of the working class just the way farm workers are. Um, and I don't think that, that we're saving people by doing that. I think we are helping them and hopefully, you know, other struggles are going to get the same kind of support and solidarity um, in the future as well. And that includes also trying to support the welfare of working people, even if there's not a strike on. You know, if you have white students at UW Tacoma who start talking about the importance of fighting around the H-2A program, what happens to the H-2A workers? Is it a good thing? And um, what happens to workers, farm workers who are displaced by that? And then as a result of your trying to understand that program, and what it's doing, you then go and talk to Patty Murray and tell her don't vote in Congress for things that are going to strengthen that program. I think that is something that's very important to do because it is fighting for the welfare of, of farm workers, of those workers, including. And so here you have white students who are crossing that color line and doing it um, for, um, doing it in the interest of the welfare of those workers. And, you know, they're not farm workers themselves, um, don't come from farm worker families possibly, um, probably if they're white, um, but I think are making an important social contribution um, as part of it. So I guess that's what I would say about it. And if you have other things that you're thinking about in terms of white saviorism, um, why don't you give us an example and we could talk about it. I was going to say, we have Verity is, uh, she's on the call here, so she might be able to clarify too. Oh, okay. Yes. Hi. Um, so I think, uh, I definitely agree that, you know, uh, white, white people and white students should all like be using our privilege to help in these scenarios and like uplift the voices of people, um, that are in more marginalized communities that like aren't listened to. I guess my question is more about, um, how, so I, I think for example, like what you're doing, it seems to be like, you know, doing, um, avoiding this trope well by kind of like emphasizing, uh, people's own, like, stories like in your work like you share that along with like your photograph so it's not like about you and what your opinion of this thing is it's like you're sharing people's stories um I guess what I like the curiosity that I have is like how 
if you've like run up against anything about that, like people, you know, saying like, oh, you know, you don't have a right to be speaking on this or whatever, just because you're white or like what you think is a general good way to like go about and like avoid um, speaking where you're not necessarily needed or wanted for that matter. <laughs> like it's not, yeah, it's not specific just to you. This is just something that I like ask uh, people that are doing this sort of work. So I get it. Um, well, I guess a couple of things to say about that. One is, um, you know, I, I do put myself into those books and I do write what I think about mm -hmm. it. I don't just present people's voices. I do present those voices and I also choose the voices, right? I choose who I'm going to interview. Um, and that's because these books are this one being, you know, the latest in a number of them, they are in a way, I guess you would call them political projects. Um, these are, I hope, um, weapons in fighting for social justice. So I'm a social justice journalist. I'm not neutral. I'm a participant journalist. That's why I look at myself really. You know, I came out of the labor movement, I came out of unions. Um, I was an immigrant rights activist from having seen the first immigration raid in the farm workers union 50 years ago. And I've helped to start immigrant rights organizations as well as participated in them and then written books about them and then taken the pictures and then written stories about them. And so the, the, the people that I choose to interview are the ones who I think are gonna help to move this movement forward. It's not a random thing. I, I don't go out into the street corner with a microphone and just interview everybody who passes. In fact, you know, the woman who I interviewed who was our sort of um, representative worker for the um, strikes at, at, in Bellingham, Rosario Ventura, um, you know, I met her and got to know her, first of all, because um, we had a, this support thing for the workers once they had come back to California and they had, the workers had, and these were the strikers had introduced me to her and we had talked about having to find somebody to interview to, whose story was gonna, we were gonna tell. And it's kind of a funny story actually because when I went to interview her at her home, I was gonna interview her husband because you know, men are more important than women, right? So, um, and so we, there I am sitting in the living room and trying to explain what we're, what we what we want to do here, and um, and he's looking very reluctant, you know, and kind of like, mm. and um, and then I was, I thought, okay, this is just not going to go anywhere, and she says, interview me. I thought that was amazing just by itself, and then we had this wonderful interview. She tells a story that was very dramatic, and. You know, it's published in one of the books, but we also used it in other ways as well, too. And then at the end of it, she had her children come out and she was a weaver. She was a, a tricky woman. And so she had this, we feel that she had been weaving. And so she put on the pieces and then her daughter put on her pieces. And we took this picture that went with it. And it was really, it was really great. Um, but it's very, so all I'm trying to say is it's intentional. It's not, it's not random. And I'm I'm there as a participant in it and as an actor in it, and so if you want to say, well, okay, um, would it have been better to have somebody who was Mexican or Latino doing this instead of you? Um, to me, that's a theoretical question. Maybe so, but there was no one other than me. I mean, in fact, not only that, it was also I also played a role in trying to figure out what to do here that we, that, you know, how the interview with them, what we did with it. So the books are made up in that way. And, um, and I think it's very important for journalists, and I would say even especially important for white journalists to be participants. I'm very suspicious of the idea of neutrality and objectivity on the part of journalists. I think you're trying to avoid taking sides. 
because I think the world is full of sides here and you have to decide, are you on the side of justice or not? And if you are, then what are you going to do about it? Um, so I guess that's, um, that's one way of, of answering the question. And the other way is that in the introduction to each of the books I've done, I've done another little piece of who I am. It's kind of these little autobiographical things, but you know, how did it come about that this white kid growing up in Oakland, not knowing any Spanish and so forth, wound up working for the Farm Workers Union and then did this stuff. And so I try to sort of like talk about what the path was as a way of sort of explaining myself, you know, and how I got there. Um, you know, that's really pretty much all I can do about it, you know. If that's not legitimate in as far as some people see it, that's okay, but I'm still going to do it anyway. <laughs> well, I, I think Verity's um, question sort of points to something I noticed with a lot of our students as they're, you know, heading heading off campus into the world, and they've been sort of activated, and they they sort of have these passions, and they want to, um, you know, they they want to. I mean, in, in some cases, leverage whatever privilege they have to advocate for others, but they want to do it in a way that's, um, you know, intentional. Um, and is you know so mindful of not centering themselves in this larger project, and um, I mean honestly, as somebody who's who's very familiar with your work over time, like it's it's like if if people just followed your example and sort of did the the due diligence of sort of uh, you know engaging with the communities and listening you know listening first long before acting, and I'm sure long before the camera comes out. You know, it's the it's the storytelling and figuring out how you can best sort of advocate on behalf of these communities. Um, I mean, that's that that's to me is the you know I guess the best part of my white privilege is that I can use it to sort of advocate for you know people who don't sort of um, you know enjoy the the privileges I have. Um, you know, but but doing it the right way and the you know sort of the. Um, you know, the, the way that's going to sort of least center myself is something that, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a matter of um, self-reflection and sort of, but again, I think David, you know, your work. I, I would say a couple of really brief things about it. Um, one is, you know, if you're leaving the university and going out into the world and you want to engage, the first thing I would tell you is don't be afraid, you know, don't start you know, it's important to understand yourself and to question yourself and to be able to explain to other people also what your motivations are for wanting to take photographs or write or whatever it is that you're going to do. Um, so you have to sort of understand yourself and get into this dialogue with yourself about what, um, what you know, why it is that you want to do these things. But don't let it stand in the way of your doing them. You know, better to go out there and and start doing the work and get criticized than not do it. You know, you can always learn from criticism. And if there's something you're doing wrong, you can always change it. But um, but it's important to act. It's important to act. You know, don't be an armchair observer. Um, the second one is that, you know, I think being a union organizer was very good for me um, training because it taught me to listen. A good union organizer listens a lot because you have to understand the people that you're working with in order to be able to work with them to help accomplish you know, the goal of, of organizing a union. And so listening to people is, is always a very good place to start with. And also, if you're not really interested in people's stories and what they have to tell you, you know, I do have to kind of wonder, are you doing this? <laughs> no. um, because I think that you have to engage you know, you have to commit, um, you know, it's not for standing on the sidelines, it's for committing. Um, and that's, and the last thing is, is that this is a, you know, especially for people who want to go to work for unions, and, but, but I think also for people in general, I think it's important um, to, to go out into the workforce. You know, I know that a lot of you who are listening are already working. You wouldn't be, you know, a working class student at UWT if you weren't already trying to not only get the loans, but then pay them off and have to work and all the rest of it. So I'm not trying to assume that you're not part of the workforce already. But I think that it's important, you know, to go and, 
if, whether it's work as a farm worker, or whether it's go to work in a factory, whether it's go to work in a hotel making beds, go out there because it's a good education. It's a good part of your education about what the real life problems are of working people who are trying to support families and deal with the problems of the workplace and all the rest of it. Um, so I think those are the three, three ways also that I would sort of try and figure out what to do after life in the university. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you so much for zooming in this evening and sharing your work. I mean, thanks, thanks for the work The you know, your entire career has been absolutely fantastic. I encourage anybody on this call right now to, to just dive in. Uh, David's got an amazing mailing list, which uh, reg regular updates um, all the new work on a near weekly basis. Yeah, and then I'll, what I'll do is I'll put in my email address here. You send me an email message, I'll put you on the list. So Excellent. And just thanks again for, for being part of this project. And, and, you know, it's just an absolute honor to, to help get your work out there um, and, and get these stories heard by more people. Um, 